Part two of Chapter twenty one of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part two of Chapter twenty one. Three. He was considerably dashed on his return home to find the door of his study still locked on the outside. The gesture which on his leaving the room seemed so natural, brilliant, and excusable now presented itself to him as the act of a coarse-minded idiot. He hesitated to unlock the door, but of course he had to unlock it. Eve sat as if at the stake, sublime. "'Arthur, why do you play these tricks on me, and especially when we are in such trouble?' "'Why did he, indeed?' "'I merely didn't want you to run after me,' said he. "'I made sure, of course, that you'd ring the bell at once and have the door open." Did you imagine for a moment that I would let any of the servants know that you'd locked me in a room? No, you couldn't have imagined that. I've too much respect for your reputation in this house to do such a thing, and you ought to know it. My child, said Mr. Crowhack, once again amazed at Eve's extraordinary gift for putting him in the wrong, and for making him still more wrong when he was wrong. This is the second time this morning that I've had to surrender to overwhelming force. Name your own terms of peace. But let me tell you, in extenuation, that I've discovered your offspring. The fact is, I got her in one. Where is she? Eve asked, not eagerly, rather negligently, for she was now more distressed about her husband's behaviour than about Sissy. At Ozzy's, as soon as he had uttered the words, Mr. Prohack saw his wife's interest fly back from himself to their daughter. What's she doing at Ozzy's? Well, she's living with him. They were married yesterday. They thought they'd save you and me and themselves a lot of trouble. But look here, my child, it's not a tragedy. What's the matter with you? Eve's face was a mask of catastrophe. She did not cry. The affair went too deep for tears. I suppose I shall have to forgive Sissy some day. But I've never been so insulted in my life. Never. And never shall I forget it. And I've no doubt that you and Sissy treated it all as a great piece of fun. You would. The poor lady had gone as pale as ivory. Mr. Bragg was astonished. He even felt hurt that he had not seen the thing from Eve's point of view earlier. Emphatically, it did amount to an insult for Eve, to say naught of the immense desolating disappointment to her. And yet Sissy, princess among daughters, had not shown by a single inflection of her voice that she had any sympathy with her mother, or any genuine appreciation of what the secret marriage would mean to her. Youth was incredibly cruel, and age, too, in the shape of Mr. Prohack himself, had not been much less cruel. "'Something's happened about that necklace since you left,' said Eve, in a dull, even voice. "'Oh, what?' "'I don't know, but I saw Mr. Crude, the detective, drive up to the house at a great pace. Then Brule came and knocked here, and as I didn't care to have to tell him that the door was locked, I kept quiet, and he went away again.' Mr. Crewe went away, too. I saw him drive away. Mr. Prohack said nothing audible, but to himself he said, She actually choked off her curiosity about the necklace so as not to give me away. There could never have been another woman like her in the whole history of human self-control. She's prodigious. And then he wondered what could have happened in regard to the necklace. He foresaw more trouble there, and the splendour of the morning had faded. An appalling silence descended upon the whole house. To escape from its sinister spell, Mr. Prohack departed and sought the seclusion of his secondary club, which he had not entered for a very long time. He dared not face the lively amenities of his principal club. He pretended, at the secondary club, that he had never ceased to frequent the place regularly, and to that end he put on a nonchalant air. But he was somewhat disconcerted to find, from the demeanour of his acquaintances there, that he possibly had not been missed to any appreciable extent. He decided that the club was a dreary haunt, and could not understand why he had never before perceived its dreariness. The members seemed to be scarcely alive, and in particular they seemed to have conspired together to behave and talk as though humanity consisted of only one sex, their own. Mr. Brahack, worried though he was by a too acute realisation of the fact that humanity did indeed consist of two sexes, despised the lot of them. And yet, simultaneously, the weaker part of him envied them, and he fully admitted, in the abstract, that something might convincingly be said in favour of monasteries. 
was a most strange experience. After a desolating lunch of excellent dishes, perfect coffee which left a taste in his mouth, and a fine cigar which he threw away before it was half finished, he abandoned the club and strolled in the direction of Manchester Square. But he lacked the courage to go into the noble mansion, and feebly and aimlessly proceeded northward until he arrived at Marylebone Road and saw the great historic crimson building of Madame Tussaud's waxworks. His mood was such that he actually, in a wild and melancholy caprice, paid money to enter this building, and inquired at once for the room known as the Chamber of Horrors. When he emerged, his gloom had reached the fantastic, hysteric, or giggling stage, and his conception of the all-embracingness of London was immensely enlarged. Uh, Miss Sissy and Mr. Morphy are with Mrs. Prohack, sir, said Brule, in a quite ordinary tone, taking the hat and coat of his returned master in the hall of the noble mansion. Mr. Prohack started. Give me back my hat and coat, said he. Tell your mistress that I may not be in for dinner. And he fled. He could not have assisted at the terrible interview between Eve and the erring daughter, who had inveigled her own betrothed into a premature marriage. Sissy, at any rate, had pluck, and she must also have had an enormous moral domination over Ozzy to have succeeded in forcing him to join her in a tragic scene. What a honeymoon! To what a pass had society come! Mr. Prohack drove straight to the monument and paid more money for the privilege of climbing it. He next visited the tower. The day seemed to consist of twenty-four thousand hours. He dined at the Trocadero restaurant, solitary at a table under the shadow of the bass fiddle of the orchestra. And finally he patronised Masculine and Cook's entertainment, and witnessed the dissipation of solid young women into air. He reached home, as it was humorously called, at ten-thirty. Uh, Mrs. Prohack has retired for the night, sir, said Brule, who never permitted his employers merely to go to bed, and wishes not to be disturbed. Thank God, breathed Mr. Prohack. Uh, yes, sir, said Brule, dutifully acquiescent. 4. The next morning Eve behaved to her husband exactly as if nothing untoward had happened. She kissed and was kissed. She exhibited sweetness without gaiety, and a general curiosity without interest. She said not a word concerning the visit of Sissy and Ozzy. She expressed the hope that Mr. Prohack had had a pleasant evening and slept well. Her anxiety to be agreeable to Mr. Prohack was touching. It was angelic. To the physical eye all was as usual, but Mr. Prohack was aware that in a single night she had built a high and unscalable wall between him and her, a wall which he could see through and which he could kiss through, but which departed him utterly from her. And yet what sin had he committed against her, save the peccadillo of locking her for an hour or two in a comfortable room? It was Sissy, not he, who had committed the sin. He wanted to point this out to Eve, but he appreciated the entire futility of doing so, and therefore refrained. About eleven o'clock Eve knocked at and opened his study door. "'May I come in, or am I disturbing you?' she asked brightly. "'Don't be a silly goose,' said Mr. Prohack, whose rising temper he hated angels, was drowning his attack. Smiling as though he had thrown her a compliment, Eve came in and shut the door. "'I've just received this,' she said. "'It came by messenger.' and she handed him a letter signed with the name of Crude, the private detective. The letter ran, Madam, I beg to inform you that I have just ascertained that the driver of taxi number 5437 has left at Scotland Yard a pearl necklace which he found in his vehicle. He states that he drove a lady and gentleman from your house to Waterloo Station on the evening of your reception, but can give no description of them. I mention the matter pro forma but do not anticipate that it can interest you as the police authorities at New Scotland Yard declare the pearls to be false. Yours obediently. P.S. I called upon you in order to communicate the above facts yesterday, but you were not at home. Mr. Brahack turned a little pale, and his voice trembled as he said, looking up from the letter, I, I wonder who the thief was. Anyhow, women are staggering. Here, some woman, I'm sure it was the woman and not the man, picks up a necklace from the floor of one of your drawing-rooms, well knowing it not to be her own, hides it, makes off with it, and then is careless enough to leave it in a taxi. 
did you ever hear of such a thing? But that wasn't my necklace, Arthur, said Eve. Of course it was your necklace, said Mr. Prohack. Do you mean to tell me? Eve began, and it was a new Eve. Of course I do, said Mr. Prohack, who had now thoroughly subdued his temper and the determination to bring to a head that trouble about the necklace and end it for ever. He was continuing his remarks when the wall suddenly fell down with an unimaginable crash. Eve said nothing, but the soundless crash deafened Mr. Prohack. Nevertheless, the mere fact that Sissy's wedding lay behind and not before him helped him somewhat to keep his spirits and his nerve. "'I will never forgive you, Arthur,' said Eve, with the most solemn and terrible candour. She no longer played a part. She was her formidable self, utterly unmasked and savagely expressive, without any regard to consequences. Mr. Prohack saw that he was engaged in a mortal duel with the buttons off a deadly foil. "'Of course you won't,' said he, gathering himself heroically together, and superbly assuming a calm which he did not in the least feel. "'Of course you won't, because there is nothing to forgive. On the contrary, you owe me your thanks. I never deceived you. I never told you the pearls were genuine. Indeed, I beg you to remind you that I once told you positively that I would never buy you a pearl necklace. Don't you remember?' You thought they were genuine, and you have had just as much pleasure out of them as if they had been genuine. You were always careless with your jewellery. Think how I should have suffered if I watched you every day being careless with a rope of genuine pearls. I should have had no peace of mind. I should have been obliged to reproach you, and as you can't bear to be reproached, you would have picked quarrels with me. Further, you have lost nothing in prestige, for the reason that all our friends and acquaintances have naturally assumed that the pearls were genuine because they were your pearls, and you were the wife of a rich man. A woman whose husband's financial position is not high and secure is bound to wear real pearls, because people will assume that her pearls are false. But a woman like yourself can wear any pinchbeck pearls with impunity, because people assume that her pearls are genuine. In your case there could be no advantage whatever in genuine pearls. To buy them would be equivalent to throwing money in the street. Now, as it is, I have saved money over the pearls, and therefore interest on money, though I did buy you the very finest procurable imitation. And think, my child, how relieved you are now. Oh, yes, you are. Don't, so don't pretend the contrary. I can deceive you, but you can't deceive me. You have no grievance whatever. You've had many hours of innocent satisfaction in your false jewels, and nobody any the worse. Indeed, my surpassing wisdom in the choice of a necklace has saved you from all further worry about the loss of the necklace, because it simply doesn't matter either one way or the other. And I say I defy you to stand there and tell me to your face that you have any grievance at all. Mr. Prowack paused for a reply, and he got it. I will never forgive you as long as I live, said Eve. Let us say no more about it. What time is that awful lunch that you've arranged with that dreadful bishop man? What would you like me to wear, please? In an instant she had rebuilt the wall higher than ever. Mr. Prohack, always through the wall, took her in his arms and kissed her. But he might as well have kissed a woman in a trance. All that could be said was that Eve submitted to his embrace, and her attitude was another brilliant illustration of the fact that the most powerful Oriental tyrants can be defied by their weakest slaves, provided that the weakest slaves know how to do it. "'You are splendid,' said Mr. Prohack, admiringly, conscious anew of his passion for her, and full of trust in the virtue of his passion to knock down the wall sooner or later. "'But you are a very naughty and ungrateful creature, and you must be punished. I will now proceed to punish you. We have much to do before the lunch. Go and get ready, and simply put on all the clothes that have cost the most money. They are the clothes fittest for your punishment.' Three quarters of an hour later, when Mr. Prohack had telephoned and sent a confirmatory note by hand to his bank, Carthew drove them away southwards, and the car stopped in front of the establishment of a very celebrated firm of jewellers near Piccadilly. "'Come along,' said Mr. Prohack, descending to the pavement, and drew after him a moving marble statue, richly attired. They entered the glittering shop, and were immediately encountered by an expectant salesman, who had the gifts of wearing a frock-coat as though he had been born in it, and, 
of reading the hearts of men. That salesman saw in a flash that big business was afoot. First of all, said Mr. Prayer, here is my card, so that we may know where we stand. The salesman read the card and was suitably impressed, but his conviction that big business was afoot seemed now to be a little shaken. "'May I venture to hope that the missing necklace has been found, sir?' said the salesman smoothly. "'We've all been greatly interested in the newspaper story.' "'That is beside the point,' said Mr. Prohack. "'I've come simply to buy a pearl necklace.' "'I beg pardon, sir, certainly. Will you have the goodness to step this way?' They were next in a private room off the shop, and the sole items of furniture were three elegant chairs, a table with a glass top, and a colossal safe. Another salesman entered the room with bows, and keys were produced, and the two salesmen between them swung back the majestic dark green doors of the safe. In another minute various pearl necklaces were lying on the table. The spectacle would have dazzled a connoisseur in pearls, but Mr. Prohack was not a connoisseur. He was not even interested in pearls, and saw on the table naught but a monotonous array of pleasing gewgaws, to his eye differing one from another only in size. He was, however, actuated by a high moral purpose, which uplifted him and enabled him to listen with dignity to the technical eulogies given by the experts. Eve, of course, behaved with impeccable correctness, hiding the existence of the wall from everybody except Mr. Prohack, but forcing Mr. Prohack to behold the wall all the time. When he had reached a state of complete bewilderment regarding the respective merits of the necklaces, Mr. Prohack judged the moment ripe for proceeding to business. With his own hands he clasped a necklace round his wife's neck and demanded, "'What is the price of this one?' Uh, eight hundred and fifty pounds,' answered the principal expert, who seemed to recognise every necklace at sight, as a shepherd recognises every sheep in his flock. "'Do you think this would suit you, my dear?' asked Mr. Prohack. "'I think so,' replied Eve, politely. "'Well, I'm not so sure,' said Mr. Prohack, reflectively. "'What about this one?' And he picked up and tried upon Eve another and a larger necklace. Uh, that, said the original expert, is uh, two thousand four hundred guineas. Seems cheap, said Mr. Prohack carelessly, but there's something about the gradation that I don't quite like. What about this one? Eve opened her mouth as if about to speak, but she did not speak. The wall, which had trembled for a few seconds, regained its monumental solidity. Uh, five thousand guineas, said the expert of the third necklace. Hmm commented Mr. Prohack, removing the gewgaw. Ah, not so bad. And yet— That necklace, the expert announced with a mien from which all deference had vanished, is one of the most perfect we have. The pearls have, if I may so express it, a homogeneity not often arrived at in any necklace. They are not very large, of course. Quite so, said Mr. Prohack, stopping him, selecting a fourth necklace. Uh, yes, the expert admitted, his deference returning. Uh, that one is undoubtedly superior. Uh, let me see, we, we have not yet exactly valued it, but I think we could put it in at uh, ten thousand guineas, uh, but perhaps pounds. I should have to consult one of the partners. It is scarcely, said Mr. Prohack, surveying the trinket judiciously on his wife's neck, scarcely the necklace of my dreams, not that I would say a word against it. Ah! And he pounced suddenly with an air of delighted surprise upon a fifth necklace, the queen of necklaces. "'My dear, try this one. Try this one. I didn't notice it before. Somehow it takes my fancy, and as I shall obviously see much more of your necklace than you will, I should like my taste to be consulted.' As he fastened the cat to the thing upon Eve's delicious nape, he could feel that she was trembling. He surveyed the dazzling string. She also surveyed it, fascinated, spellbound. Even Mr. Prowker began to perceive that the reputation and value of fine pearls might perhaps be not entirely unmerited in the world. Is sixteen thousand five hundred, said the expert. Pounds or guineas? Mr. Prohack blandly inquired. Uh, well, sir, shall we say pounds? I think I'll take it, said Mr. Prohack with undiminished blandness. No, my dear, don't take it off. Don't take it off. Arthur, Eve breathed, seeming to expire in a kind of agonised protest. "'May I have a few minutes' private conversation with my wife?' Mr. Prohack suggested. "'Could you leave us?' One expert glanced at the other awkwardly. Uh, "'Pardon my lack of savoir-vivre,' said Mr. Prohack. 
Of course you cannot possibly leave us alone with all these valuables. Never mind. We'll call again. The principal expert rose sublimely to the great height of the occasion. He had a courageous mind, and was moreover well acquainted with the fantastic folly of allowing customers to call again. Within his experience of some thirty years, he had not bet half a dozen exceptions to the rule that customers who called again, if ever they did call, called in a mood of hard and miserly sanity, which for the purposes of the jewellery business was sickeningly inferior to their original mood. Uh, "'Please, please, Mr. Prohack," said he, with grand deprecation, and departed out of the room with his fellow. No sooner had they gone than the wall sank. It did not tumble with a crash. It most gently subsided. Arthur, Eve exclaimed with a curious uncertainty of voice, are you mad? Yes, said Mr. Prohoe. Well, said she, if you think I shall walk about London with sixteen thousand five hundred pounds round my neck, you're mistaken. But I insist. You were a martyr, and our marriage was ruined because I didn't give you real pearls. I intend you shall have real pearls. But not these, said Eve. It's too much. It's a fortune. I'm aware of that, Mr. Prowler agreed. But what is sixteen thousand five hundred pounds to me? Truly I couldn't, darling, he wheedled. I'm not your darling, said Mr. Prowler. How can I be your darling when you're never going to forgive me? Look here, I'll let you choose another necklace, but only on the condition that you forgive all my alleged transgressions, past, present, and to come. She kissed him. You can have the one at five thousand guineas, said Mr. Prowler. Nothing less. That is my ultimatum. Put it on, put it on quick, or I may change my mind. He recalled the experts, who, when they heard the grave news, smiled bravely, and looked upon Eve as upon a woman whose like they might never see again. My wife will wear the necklace at once, said Mr. Brohack. Pen and ink, please. He wrote a cheque. My car is outside. Perhaps you will send someone up to my bank immediately and cash this. We'll wait. I've warned the bank. There'll be no delay. The case can be delivered at my house. You can make out the receipt and usual guarantee while we're waiting. And so it occurred, as he had ordained. Would you care for us to arrange for the insurance? We undertake to do it as cheaply as anybody, the expert suggested later. Mr. Brohack was startled, for in his inexperience he had not thought of such complications. I was just going to suggest it, he answered placidly. I feel quite queer said Eve, as she fingered the necklace in the car, when all formalities were accomplished, and they had left the cave of Aladdin. "'And well you may, my child,' said Mr. Brohack. "'The interest on the price of that necklace would about pay the salary of a Member of Parliament, or even of a professional cricketer. And remember that whenever you wear the thing, you are in danger of being waylaid, brutally attacked, and robbed.' "'I wish you wouldn't be silly,' Eve murmured. "'I do hope I shan't seem self-conscious at the lunch.' We haven't reached the lunch yet, Mr. Prohack replied. We must go and buy a safe first. There's no safe worth twopence in the house, and a really safe safe is essential. And I want it to be clearly understood that I shall keep the key of that safe. We aren't playing at necklaces now. Life is earnest. And when they had bought a safe and were once more in the car, he said, examining her impartially, After all, at a distance of four feet, it doesn't look nearly so grand as the one that's lying at Socot in the yard. I gave thirty pounds for that one. End of part two of chapter twenty one. Part one of chapter twenty two of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter twenty two. Mr. Prohack's triumph. One. "'And where is your charming daughter?' asked Mr. Softly Bishop, so gently of Eve, when he had greeted her, and quite incidentally Mr. Prohack, in the entrance hall of the Grand Babylon Hotel. He was alone, no sign of Miss Fancy. "'Sissy,' said Eve calmly, "'I haven't the slightest idea.' "'But I included her in my invitations, and Mr. Morphy too.' Mr. Prohack was taken aback, foreseeing the most troublesome complications, and he glanced at Eve as if for guidance and support. He was nearly ready to wish that, after all, Sissy had not gone and got married secretly and prematurely. Eve, however, seemed quite undisturbed, though she offered him neither guidance nor support. Uh, "'Surely,' 
said Mr. Brough hesitatingly. Surely you, you didn't mention Sissy in your letter to me. Naturally I didn't, my dear fellow, answered Mr. Bishop. I wrote to her separately, knowing the position taken up by the modern young lady. And she telephoned me yesterday afternoon that she and Morphy would be delighted to come. Then if you know so much about the modern young lady, said Eve, with bright and perfect self-possession, you wouldn't expect any daughter to arrive with her parents, would you? Mr. Softly Bishop laughed. "'You're only putting off the evil moment,' said Mr. Prohack, in the silence of his mind, to Eve. And similarly, he said to Mr. Softly Bishop, "'I do wish you wouldn't call me my dear fellow. True, I come to your lunch, but I'm not your dear fellow, and I never will be.' "'I invited your son also, Prohack,' continued Mr. Bishop, "'together with Miss Winstock, or Warburton, she appears to have two names, to make a pair, uh, to make a pair, you understand.' "'But, unfortunately, he's been suddenly called out of town on the most urgent business.' As he uttered these last words, Mr. Bishop glanced in a peculiar manner partly at his nose and partly at Mr. Prohack. It was a singular feat of glancing, and Mr. Prohack uncomfortably wondered what it meant, for Charles lay continually on Mr. Prohack's chest, and at the slightest provocation Charles would lie more heavily than usual. "'Am I right in assuming that the necklace affair is satisfactorily settled?' Mr. Softly Bishop inquired, his spectacles gleaming and blinking at the adornment of Eve's neck. "'You are,' said Eve, "'but it wouldn't be advisable for you to be too curious about details.' Her aplomb, her sang-froid, astounded Mr. Prohack, and relieved him. With an admirable ease she went on to congratulate their host upon his engagement, covering him with petals of flattery and good wishes. Mr. Prohack could scarcely recognise his wife, and he was not sure that he liked her new worldliness quite as much as her old ingenuous and sometimes inarticulate simplicity. At any rate, she was a changed woman. He steadied himself, however, by a pertinent reflection. She was always a changed woman. Then Sissy and Ozzie appeared, looking as though they had been married for years. Mr. Prohack's heart began to beat. Ignoring Mr. Softly Bishop, Sissy embraced her mother with prim affectionateness, and Eve surveyed her daughter with affectionate solicitude. Mr. Prohack felt that he would never know what had passed between these two on the previous day, for they were a pair of sphinxes when they chose, and he was too proud to encourage confidences from Ozzy. Whatever it might have been, it was now evidently buried deep, and the common life, after a terrible pause, had resumed. "'How do you do, Miss Prohack?' said Mr. Softly Bishop, greeting. So glad you could come. Mr. Brohack suspected that his cheeks were turning pale, and was ashamed of himself. Even Sissy, for all her young, hard confidence, wavered. But Eve stepped in. Don't you know, Mr. Bishop? Oh, no, of course you don't. We ought to have told you. My daughter is now Mrs. Morphy. You see, in our family we all have such a horror of the conventional wedding and reception and formal honeymoon and so on that we decided the marriage should be strictly private, with no announcements of any kind. I really think you are the first to know. One thing I've always liked about actresses is that in the afternoon you can read of them getting married that day, and then go and see them play the same evening. It seems to me so sensible. And as we were all of the same opinion in our house, especially Sissy and her father, there was no difficulty. Upon my word, said Mr. Softly Bishop, shaking hands with Ozzy, I believe I shall follow your example. Mr. Prohack sank into a chair. I feel rather faint, he said. Bishop, do you think we might have a cocktail or so? My dear fellow, how thoughtless of me, of course. Waiter, waiter. As Mr. Bishop swung round in the direction of waiters, Eve turned in alarm to Mr. Prohack. Mr. Prohack, with much deliberation, winked at her, and she drew back. Yes, he murmured. You'll be the death of me one day, and then you'll be sorry. "'I don't think a cocktail is at all a good thing for you, Dad,' Sissy calmly observed. The arrival of Miss Fancy provided a distraction more agreeable than Mr. Prohack thought possible. He positively welcomed the slim, angular blonde, for she put an end to a situation which, prolonged another moment, would have resulted in a severe general constraint. "'You're late, my dear,' said Mr. Softly Bishop firmly. The girl's steely, blue-eyed glance shot out at the greeting, but seemed to drop off flatly from Mr. Bishop's adamantine spectacles like a bullet from Bessemer armour. 
Am I? she replied uncertainly, in her semi-American accent. Why else the lady's cloakroom of this place? I'll show you, said Mr. Bishop, with no compromise. The encounter was of the smallest, but it made Mr. Brahax suspect that perhaps Mr. Bishop was not, after all, going into the great warfare of matrimony blindly or without munition. "'I have taken the opportunity to tell Miss Fancy that you will be the only unmarried woman at my lunch,' said Mr. Bishop amusingly, when he returned from piloting his beloved. A neat fellow, beyond question. Miss Fancy had apparently to redress herself, judging from the length of her absence. Her cocktails, however, beguiled the suspense. "'Is that for me?' she asked, picking up a full glass when she came back. "'No, my dear,' said Mr. Bishop. "'It isn't. We shall go into lunch.' And they went into lunch, leaving unconsumed the cocktail which the abstemious and Spartan sissy had declined to drink. 2. "'I suppose you've been to see the twelfth and thirteen, said Eve, in her new, grand, gracious manner to Miss Fancy, when the party was seated at a round, richly flowered table, specially reserved up by Mr. Softly Bishop on the embankment front of the restaurant, and the hors d'oeuvre had begun to circulate on the white cloth, which was as crowded as the gold room. "'I'm afraid I haven't,' muttered Miss Fancy weakly, but with due refinement. The expression of fear was the right expression. Eve had put the generally brazen woman in a fright at the first effort. And the worst was that Miss Fancy did not even know what the twelve and thirteen was, or were. At the opening of her debut at what she imagined to be the great, yet exclusive, and fashionable world, Miss Fancy was failing. Of what used to be perfectly dressed and jewelled, to speak with a sometimes carefully corrected accent, to sit at the best table in the London restaurant most famous in the United States, to be affianced to the cleverest fellow she had ever struck, if the wonderful and famous hostess, Mrs. Prohack, whose desirable presence was due only to Softly's powerful influence in high circles, could floor her at the very outset of the conversation. It is a fact that Miss Fancy would have given the emerald ring of her left first finger to be able to answer back. All Miss Fancy could do was to smite Mr. Softly Bishop with a homicidal glance, for that he had not in advance put her wise about something called the Twelve and the Thirteen. It is also a fact that Miss Fancy would have perished sooner than say to Mrs. Prohack the simple words, I haven't the slightest idea what the Twelve and Thirteen are. Eve did not disguise her impression that Miss Fancy's lapse was very strange and disturbing. I suppose you've seen the new version of the Sacre du Printemps, Miss Fancy, said Mrs. Oswald Morphy, that exceedingly modern and self-possessed young married lady. Uh, not yet, said Miss Fancy, and foolishly added, uh, we were thinking of going to-night. There won't be any more performances this season, said Ozzy, the prince of authorities on the universe of entertainment. And in this way the affair continued between the four while Mr. Softly Bishop, abandoning his beloved to her fate, chatted murmuringly with Mr. Prohack about the oil market, as to which, of course, Mr. Prohack was the prince of authorities. Mrs. Prohack and her daughter and son-in-law ranged at ease over all the arts, without exception, save the one art, that of musical comedy, in which Miss Fancy was versed. Mr. Prohack was amazed at the skilled cruelty of his women, he wanted to say to Miss Fancy, "'Don't you believe it? My wife is only a rather nice, ordinary, housekeeping sort of little woman. And as for my daughter, she cooks her husband's meals, and jolly badly, I bet.' He ought to have been pleased at the discomfiture of Miss Fancy, whom he detested and had despised, but he was not. He yearned to succour her. He even began to like her. And not Eve and Sissy alone amazed him. Oswald amazed him. Oswald had changed. His black silk stock had gone the way of his ribboned eyeglass. His hair was arranged differently. He closely resembled an average plain man, he, the unique Aussie. With all his faults, he had previously been both good-natured and negligent, but his expression was now one of sternness and of resolute endeavour. Sissy had already metamorphosed him. Even now he was obediently following her lead and her mood, Mr. Prohack's women had evidently determined to revenge themselves for being asked to meet Miss Fancy at lunch, and Ozzy had been set on to assist them. 
Further, Mr. Bragg noticed that Sissy was eyeing her mother's necklace with a reprehending stare. The next instant he found himself the target of the same stare. The girl was accusing him of folly, while questioning Ozzy's definition of the difference between Georgian and Neo-Georgian verse. The girl had apparently become the censor of society at large. Mysterious cross-currents ran over the table in all directions. Mr. Brohack looked around at the noisy restaurant, packed with tables, and wondered whether cross-currents were running invisibly over all the tables, and what was the secret force of fashionable fleeting convention which enabled women with brains far inferior to his own to use it effectively for the fighting of sanguinary battles. At last, when Miss Fancy had been beaten into silence, and the other three were carrying on a brilliant, high-browed conversation into the corpse of her up-to-dateness, Mr. Bragg's nerves reached the point at which he could tolerate the tragic spectacle no more, and he burst out vulgarly in a man-in-the-street vein, chopping off the brilliant conversation as with a chopper. "'Now, Miss Fancy, tell us something about yourself.' The common-sounding phrase seemed to be a magic formula endowed with the power to break an awful spell. Miss Fancy gathered herself together, forgot that she had been defeated, and inaugurated a new battle. She began to tell the table not something, but almost everything, about herself, and it soon became apparent that she was no ordinary woman. She had never had a setback. In innumerable conversational duels she had always given the neat and deadly retort, and she had never been worsted, save by base combinations deliberately engineered against her, generally by women, whom as a sex she despised even more than men. Her sincere belief that no biographical detail concerning Miss Fancy was too small to be uninteresting to the public amounted to a religious creed, and her memory for details was miraculous. She recalled the exact total of the takings at any given performance in which she was prominent in any city of the United States, and she could also give long extracts from the favourable criticisms of countless important American newspapers. By a singular coincidence, only unimportant newspapers had ever mingled blame with their praise of her achievements. She regarded herself with detachment as a remarkable phenomenon, and therefore she could impersonally describe her career without any of the ordinary restraints, just as a shopman might clothe or unclothe a model in his window. Thus she could display her heart and its history quite unreservedly. Do they not belong to the public? The astounded table learned that Miss Fancy was illustrious in the press of the United States as having been engaged to be married more often than any other actress. Yet she had never got as far as the altar, though once she had reached the church door, only to be swept away from it by a cyclone which unhappily finished off the bridegroom. What grey and tedious existences Eve and Sissy had led! A penultimate engagement had been to the late Silas Angler. "'Something told me I should never be his wife,' she said vivaciously. "'You know the feeling we women have? "'And I wasn't much surprised to hear of his death. "'I would refused Silas eight times. "'Then in the end I promised to marry him by a certain date. "'He wouldn't take no, poor dear. "'Well, he was a gentleman, anyway. "'Of course it was no more than right that he should put me down in his will, "'but not every man would have done. "'In fact, it never happened to me before. "'Wasn't it strange I should have that feeling about never being his wife?' She glanced eagerly at Mr. Prohack and Mr. Prohack's women, and there was a pause in which Mr. Softy Bishop said, affectionately regarding his nose, "'Well, my dear, you'll be my wife, you'll find.' And he uttered this observation in a sharp tone of conviction that made a quite disturbing impression on the whole company, and not least on Mr. Prohack, who kept asking himself more and more insistently, "'Why is Softy Bishop marrying Miss Fancy, and why is Miss Fancy marrying Softy Bishop?' Mr. Brohap was interrupted in his private inquiry into this enigma by a very unconventional nudge from Sissy, who silently directed his attention to Eve, who seemingly wanted it. "'Your friend seems anxious to speak to you,' murmured Eve, in a low, rather roguish voice. His friend was Lady Massiman, who was just concluding a solitary lunch at a near table. He had not noticed her, being still sadly remiss in the business of existing fully in a fashionable restaurant. Lady Massingham's eyes confirmed Eve's statement. "'I'm sure Miss Fancy will excuse you for a moment,' said Eve. "'Oh, please!' 
and form his fancy grandly. Mr. Brahak self-consciously carried his lankness and his big head across to Lady Massingham's table. She looked up at him with a composed but romantic smile. That is to say that Mr. Brohack deemed it romantic, and he leaned over the table and over Lady Massingham in a manner romantic to match. I am just going off, said she. Simple words from a portly and mature lady, yet for Mr. Brohack they were charged with all sorts of delicious secondary significances. What is the difference between her and Eve? he asked himself, and then replied to the question in a flash of inspiration, I am romantic to her, and I am not romantic to Eve. He liked this ingenious explanation. I wanted to tell you, said she gravely, with beautiful melancholy, Charles is flambé. He is done in. I cannot help him. He will not let me. But if I see him to-night when he returns to town, I shall send him to you. He is very young, very difficult, but I shall insist that he goes to you. How kind you are, said Mr. Prohack, touched. Lady Massillum rose, shook hands, seemed to blush, and departed. An interview as brief as it had been strange. Mr. Prohack was thrilled not at all by the announcement of Charlie's danger, perhaps humiliation, but by the attitude of Lady Massillum. He had his plans for Charlie. He had no plans affecting Lady Massillum. Mr. Softly Bishop's luncheon had developed during the short absence of Mr. Brohack. Its splendour, great from the first, had increased. If tables ever do groan, which is perhaps doubtful, this table was certainly groaning. Mr. Softly Bishop was just dismissing, with bland and legitimate approval, the majordomo of the restaurant, with whom, like all truly important personages, he appeared to be on intimate terms but the chief development of the luncheon disclosed itself in the conversation. Mr. Softly Bishop had now taken charge of the talk, and was expatiating to a hushed and crushed audience his plans for a starring world tour for his future wife, who listened to them with genuine admiration on her violet-tinted face. "'Eliza won't be in it with me when I come back,' she explained suddenly, with deep conviction, with anticipatory bliss, with a kind of rancorous felicity. Mr. Prohack understood. Miss Fancy was uncompromisingly jealous of her half-sister's renown. To outdo that renown was the main object of her life, and Mr. Softly Bishop's claim on her lay in the fact that he had shown her how to accomplish her end, and was taking charge of the arrangement. Mr. Softly Bishop was her trainer and her manager. He had dazzled her by the variety and ingenuity of his resourceful schemes, and his power over her was based on a continual implied menace that if she did not strictly obey all his behests, she would fail to realise her supreme desire. And when Mr. Softly Bishop gradually drew Ozzy into a technical tete-a-tete, -tete, Mr. Prohack understood further why Ozzy had been invited to the feast. Upon certain branches of Mr. Bishop's theatrical schemes, Ozzy was an acknowledged expert, and Mr. Bishop was obtaining, for the price of a luncheon, the fruity knowledge and wisdom acquired by Ozzy during long years of close attention to business. For Mr. Brohack, it was an enthralling scheme. The luncheon closed gorgeously upon the finest cigars and cigarettes, the finest coffee, and the finest liqueurs that the unique establishment could provide. Sissy refused every allurement except coffee, and Miss Fancy was permitted nothing but coffee. "'Do not forget your throat, my dear.' Softly Bishop authoritatively interjected into Miss Fancy's circumstantial recital of the expenses of the bouquets which had been hurled at her at the new National Theatre at Washington. And by the way, looking at his watch, do not forget the appointment with the elocutionist. But aren't you coming with me? demanded Miss Fancy, alarmed. Already she was learning the habit of helplessness, so attractive to men and so useful to them. These remarks broke up the luncheon party which all the guests assured the deprecating host had been perfectly delightful, with the implied addition that it had also constituted the crown and summit of their careers. Eve and Sissy were prodigious in superlatives to such an extent that Mr. Prohack began to fear for Mr. Softly Bishop's capacity to assimilate the cruder forms of flattery. His fear, however, was unnecessary. When the host and his beloved departed, Miss Fancy was still recounting titbits of her biography. "'But I'll tell you the rest another time,' she cried from the moving car. 
she had emphatically won the second battle. From the first blow she never even looked like losing, and she had shown no mercy, quite properly following the maxim that war is war. Even Sissy seemed to rise with difficulty to their knees, after the ruthless adversary, tired of standing on their prostrate form, had scornfully walked away. 3. Well, sighed Mrs. Prohack, with the maximum of expressiveness, glancing at her daughter as one woman of the world at another. They were lingering, as it were convalescent, after the severe attack and defeat in the foyer of the hotel. Well, sighed Sissy, flattered by the glance, and firmly taking her place in the fabric of society. Well, father, we always knew you had some queer friends, but really these were the limit. And the extravagance of the thing! That luncheon must have cost at least twenty pounds, and I do believe he had special flowers, too. When I think of the waste of money and time that goes on daily in places like these, I wonder if there's any England left. It ought to be stopped by law. My child, said Mr. Prohack, I observe with approbation that you are beginning to sit up and take notice. Centuries already divide you from the innocent creature who used to devote her nights and days to the teaching of dancing to persons who had no conception of the seriousness of life. I agree with your general criticism, but let us remember that all this wickedness does not date from the day before yesterday. It has been flourishing for some thousands of years, and all prophecies about it being overtaken by nemesis have proved false. Still, I am glad you have turned over a new leaf. Sissy, discreetly but unmistakably, tossed her young head. Oswald, dearest, said she, it is time you were off. It is, Ozzy agreed, and off he went, to resume the serious struggle for existence. He, who until quite recently had followed the great theatrical convention that though space may be a reality, time is not. I don't mind the extravagance, because after all it's good for trade, said Eve. What I— Mother, darling, Sissy protested. Do you get these extraordinary ideas from about luxury being good for trade? Surely you ought to know. I dare say I ought to know all sorts of things I don't know, said Eve with dignity. But there's one thing I do know, and that is that the style of those two dreadful people was absolutely the worst I've ever met. The way that woman gabbled and all about herself, and what an accent, and the way she held her fork. Lady, said Mr. Bragg, don't be angry because she beat you. Beat me? Yes, beat you, both of you. You talked her to a standstill at first, but you couldn't keep it up. Then she began, and she talked you to a standstill, and she could keep it up. She left you for all practical purposes dead on the field, my tigresses. And I'm very sorry for her, he added. Dad, said Sissy sternly, why do you always try to be so clever with us? You know as well as we do that she's a creature, and that there's nothing to be said for her at all. Nothing to be said for her? Mr. Bragg smiled tolerantly. Why, she was the star of the universe for Silas Angmering, the founder of our fortune. She was the finest woman he'd ever met. And Angmering was a clever fellow, let me tell you. You call her a creature. Yes, the creature of destiny, like all of us, except, of course, you. I beg to inform you that Miss Fancy went out of this hotel a victim, an unconscious victim, but a victim. She is going to be exploited. Mr. Softly Bishop, my co-heir, will run her for all she is worth. He will make a lot of money out of her. He will make her work as she has never worked before. He will put a value on all her talents for his own ends. And he will deprive her of most of her accustomed pleasures. In fifteen years there will be nothing left of Miss Fancy except an exhausted wreck with a spurious reputation. But Mr. Softly Bishop will still be in his prime and in the full enjoyment of life, and he will spend on himself the riches that she has made for him, and allow her about sixpence a week. And the most tragic and terrible thing of all is that she will think she owes everything to him. No! If I was capable of weeping, I should have wept at the pathos of the spectacle of Miss Fancy, as she left us just now, unconscious of her fate, and revelling in the most absurd illusions. That poor defenceless woman, who has had the misfortune not to please you, is heading straight for a life-long martyrdom. Mr. Prahak ceased impressively. And serve her right, said Eve. I've met cats in my time, but... And Eve also ceased. 
"'And I am not sure,' added Mr. Prohack, still impressively, "'and I am not sure that the ingenuous and excellent Oswald Morphy "'is not heading straight in the same direction.' "'And he gazed at his adored daughter, "'who exhibited a faint flush, and then laughed lightly. "'Yes,' said Mr. Prohack, "'you are very smart, my girl. "'If you had shown violence, you would have made a sad mistake. "'That you should laugh with such a brilliant invitation of naturalness "'gives me hope of you.' Let a seat carth you on the car. Mr. Bishop's luncheon, though I admit it was exceedingly painful, has, I trust, not been without its useful lessons to us, and I do not regret it. For myself, I admit it has taught me that even the finest and most agreeable women, such as those with whom I have been careful to surround myself in my domestic existence, are monsters of cruelty. Not that I care. I have arranged with Mamma that you shall come to dinner to-night, said Sissy. No formality, please. "'Mayn't your mother wear her pearls?' asked Mr. Prohack. "'I hope you noticed, Arthur,' said the youth, with triumphant satisfaction, "'how your Miss Fancy was careful to keep off the subject of the jewels.' "'Mother's pearls,' said Sissy primly, "'are mother's affair.' Mr. Prohack did not feel at all happy. "'And yet,' he asked himself, "'what have I done? I am perfectly innocent.' End of Part 1 of Chapter 22Part two of chapter twenty two of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part two of chapter twenty two. Four. I never in all my life, said Sissy, saw you eat so much, Dad. And I think it's a great compliment to my cooking. In fact, I'm bursting with modest pride. Well, replied Mr. Prohack, who had undoubtedly eaten rather too much. Take it how you like. I do believe I could do with a bit more of this stuff that imitates an omelette but obviously isn't one. Oh, but there isn't any more, said Sissy, somewhat dashed. No more? Good heavens! And have you got some cheese or anything of that sort? No, I don't keep cheese in the place. You see, the smell of it in these little flats. Any bread? Anything at all? I'm afraid we've finished up pretty nearly all there was, except Ozzy's egg for breakfast tomorrow morning. "'This is serious,' observed Mr. Prohack, tapping inquiringly the superficies of his digestive apparatus. "'Arthur,' cried Eve, "'why are you such a tease to-night? You're only trying to make the child feel awkward. You know you've had quite enough, and I'm sure it was all very cleverly cooked, considering. You'll be ill in the middle of the night if you keep on, and then I shall have to get up and look after you, as usual.' Eve had the air of defending her daughter, but something, some reserve in her voice, showed that she was defending not her daughter, but merely and generally the whole race of housewives against the whole race of consuming and hypocritical males. She was even defending the Eve who had provided much criticised meals in the distant past. Such was her skill that she could do this while implying, so subtly yet so effectively, that Sissy, the wicked, shameless, mamma-scorning bride, was by no means forgiven in the secret heart of the mother. "'You are doubtless right, lady,' Mr. Prohack agreed. You always could judge better than I could myself, when I'd had enough, and what would be the ultimate consequences of my eating. And as for your lessons in manners, what an ill-bred lout I was before I met you! What an impossible person I should have been had you not taken me in hand, night and day, for all these years! It isn't that I'm worse than the average husband. It is merely that wives are the sole repositories of the civilizing influence. Were it not for them, we should still be tearing stakes to pieces with our fingers, I dare say I have eaten enough. Anyhow, I've had far more than anybody else. And even if I hadn't, it would not be at all nice of it not to pretend that I hadn't. And after all, if the worst comes to the worst, I can always have a slice of cold beef and a glass of beer when I get home, can't I? Sissy, though blushing ever so little, maintained an excellent front. She certainly looked dainty and charming, more specifically so than she had ever looked, indeed, utterly the young bride. She was in mourning dress to comply with her own edict against formality, and also to mark her new enthusiastic disapproval of the modern craze for luxurious display. But it was a delightful, if inexpensive, dress. She had taken considerable trouble over the family dinner, devising, concocting, cooking, and presiding over it from beginning to end, and being consistently bright, wise, able, and resourceful throughout. 
an apostle of chafing dish cookery, determined to prove that chafing dish cookery combined efficiency, toothsomeness, and economy to a degree never before known. And she had neatly pointed out more than once that waste was impossible under her system, and that, servants being dispensed with, the great originating cause of waste had indeed been radically removed. She had not informed her guests of the precise cost in money of the unprecedentedly cheap and nourishing meal, but she had come near to doing so, and she would surely have indicated that there had been neither too much nor too little, but just amply sufficient, had not her absurd and contrarious father displayed a not uncharacteristic lack of tact at the closing stage of the ingenious collation. Moreover, she seemed, despite her generous build, to have somehow fitted herself to the small size of the flat. She did not dwarf it, as clumsy women are apt to dwarf their tiny homes in the centre of London. On the contrary, she gave to it the illusion of spaciousness, and beyond question she had, in a surprisingly short time, transformed it from a bachelor's flat into a conjugal nest, cushiony, flowery, knick-knacky, and perilously seductive to the eye, without being too reassuring to the limbs. Mr. Prohack was accepting a cigarette, having been told that Ozzy never smoked cigars, when there was a great ring which filled the entire flat, as the last trump may be expected to fill the entire earth, and Mr. Prohack dropped the cigarette, muttering, I think I'll smoke that afterwards. Good gracious, the flat mistress exclaimed, I wonder who that can be. Just go and see Ozzy, darling. And she looked at Ozzy as if to say, I hope it isn't one of your indiscreet bachelor friends. Ozzy hastened obediently out. It may be Charlie, ventured he. Wouldn't it be nice if he called? Yes, wouldn't it, Cissy agreed. I did phone him up to try to get him to dinner, but naturally he was away for the day. He's always as invisible as a millionaire nowadays. Besides, I feel somehow this place would be too much, too humble for the mighty Charles. Buckingham Palace would be more in his line. But we can't all be speculators and profiteers. Cissy, protested their mother mildly. After mysterious and intriguing noises at the front door had finished, and the front door had made the whole flat vibrate to its bang, Ozzie puffed into the room with three packages, the two smaller being piled upon the third. "'They're addressed to you,' said Ozzie to his father-in-law. "'Did you give the man anything?' says he asked quickly. "'No, it was Carthew on the parlour-maid. Uh, Machin, is that her name?' "'Oh,' said Sissy, apparently relieved. "'Now, let us see.' said Mr. Prohack, starting at once upon the packages. "'Don't waste that string, Dad,' Sissy enjoined him anxiously. "'Huh? What do you say?' murmured Mr. Prohack, carefully cutting string on all sides of all packages, and tearing first-rate brown paper into useless strips. He produced from the packages four bottles of champagne of four different brands, a quantity of pâté de foie gras, a jar of caviar, and several bunches of grapes that must have been grown under the most unnatural and costly conditions. "'Whatever's this?' Sissy demanded uneasily. "'Arthur,' said Eve, "'whatever's the meaning of this?' "'It has a deep significance,' replied Mr. Prohack. "'The only fault I have to find with it is that it has arrived rather late, "'and yet perhaps, like Blucher, not too late. "'You can call it a wedding present if you choose, daughter. "'Or, if you choose, you can call it simply caviar, pâté de foie gras, grapes, and champagne. "'I really have not had the courage to give you a wedding present.' he continued, knowing how particular you are about ostentation. But I thought if I sent something along that we could all join in consuming instantly, I couldn't possibly do any harm. "'We haven't any champagne glasses,' said Sissy, coldly. "'Champagne glasses, child? You ought never to drink champagne out of champagne glasses. Tumblers are the only thing for champagne. Some tumblers, Ozzy, and a tin opener. You must have a tin opener. I feel convinced you have a tin opener. Upon my soul, Eve, I was right after all. I am hungry, but my hunger is nothing to my thirst. I am beginning to suspect that I must be the average sensual man. Arthur, Eve warned him, if you eat any of that caviar, you are bound to be ill. Not if I mix it with pâté de foie gras, my pet. It is notorious that they are mutual antidotes, especially when followed by the grape cure. Now, ladies and Ozzie, don't exasperate me by being coy. Fall to, ingurgitate. Ozzie, be a man for a change. Mr. Brohack seemed to intimidate everybody to such an extent that Sissy herself went off to secure tumblers. "'But why are you opening another bottle, father?' she asked in alarm on her return. "'This one isn't half empty.' 
We shall try all four brands, said Mr. Prohack. But what a waste! No, my child, said Mr. Prohack, with marked and solemn sententiousness. Know that, in an elaborately organised society, waste has its moral uses. Know further that nothing is more contrary to the truth than the proverb that enough is as good as a feast. Know still further that though the habit of wastefulness may have its dangers, it is not nearly so dangerous as the habit of self-righteousness, or as the habit of nearness, both of which contract the soul until it is more like a prune than a plum. Be a plum, my child, and let who will be a prune. With this moment, Eve showed her true greatness. "'Come along, Sissy,' said she, after an assaying glance at her husband and another at her daughter. "'Let's humour him. It isn't often he's in such good spirits, is it?' Sissy's face cleared, and with a wisdom really beyond her years, she accepted the situation, the insult, the reproof, the lesson. As for Mr. Prohack, he felt happier, more gay than he had felt all day, not as the effect of champagne and caviar, but as the effect of the realisation of his prodigious sagacity in having foreseen that Sissy's hospitality would be what it had been. He was glad, also, that his daughter had displayed common sense, and he began to admire her again, and in proportion, as she perceived that he was admiring her, so she consciously increased her charm. For the fact was, she was very young, very impressionable, very anxious to do the right thing. "'Have another glass, Ozzie,' urged Mr. Prohack. Ozzie looked at his powerful bride for guidance. "'I do have another glass, you darling old silly,' said the bride. "'There will be no need to open the other two bottles,' said Mr. Brohack. "'Indeed, I need only have opened one. I shall probably call here again soon.' At this point there was another ring at the front door. "'So you've condescended!' Sissy greeted Charles when Ozzie brought him into the room. And then, catching her father's eye and being anxious to rest to secure the paternal admiration, she added, "'Anyway, it was very decent of you to come. I know how busy you are.' Charles raised his eyebrows at this astonishing piece of sisterliness. His mother kissed him fondly, having received from Mr. Prohack during the day the delicatest, filmiest hint that perhaps Charlie was not at the moment fabulously prospering. "'Your father is very gay to-night,' said she, gazing at Charlie, as though she read into the recess of his soul, and could see a martyrdom there, though in fact she could not penetrate any further than the boy's eyeball. "'I beg you to note,' Mr. Prohack remarked, "'that as the glasses have only been filled once, and three of them are at least a quarter full, only the equivalent of two and a half champagne glasses has actually been drunk by four people, which will not explain much gaiety. If the old gentleman is gay, and he does not assert that he is not, the true reason lies in either the caviar, or the pâté de foie gras, or in his crystal conscience. Have a drink, Charles. Finish mine, my pet, said Eve, holding forth her tumbler, and Charlie obeyed. A touching sight, observed Mr. Prohack. Now, as Charlie has managed to spare us a few minutes out of his thrilling existence, I want to have a few words with him in private about an affair of state. There's nothing that you oughtn't to hear, addressed the company but a great deal that you probably wouldn't understand. And the last thing we desire is to humiliate you. That's so, isn't it, Carlos? Uh, it is, Charles quickly agreed, without a sign of self-consciousness. Now then, hostess, can you lend us another room? Boudoir, morning room, smoking room, card room, even ballroom. Anything will do for us. Possibly Ozzy's study? Father, father, sister warned him against an excess of facetiousness. You can either go into our bedroom, or you can sit on the stairs and talk. As father and son disappeared together into the bedroom, which constituted a full half of the entire flat, Mr. Brohack noticed on his wife's features an expression of anxiety, tempered by an assured confidence in his own wisdom and force. He knew, indeed, that he had made quite a favourable sensation by his handling of Sissy's tendency to a hard austerity. Nevertheless, when Charles shut the door of the chamber, and they were enclosed together, Mr. Brohack could feel his mighty heart beating in a manner worthy of a schoolgirl entering an examination room. The chamber had apparently been taken bodily out of a doll's house, and furnished with furniture manufactured for pygmies. It was very full, presenting the aspect of a room in a warehouse. Everything in it was bijou, in the trade sense, and everything harmonised in a charming Japanese manner with everything else, except an extra truckle bed showing crude arm feet under a blazing counterpane borrowed from a Russian ballet, 
which second bed had evidently just been added for the purposes of conjugal existence. The dressing-table alone was unmistakably symptomatic of a woman. Some of Ozzy's wondrous trousers hung from stretchers behind the door, and the inference was that these had been displaced from the wardrobe in favour of Sissy's frocks. It was all highly curious and somewhat pathetic, and Mr. Prohack, contemplating, became anew a philosopher, as he realised that the tiny apartment was the true expression of his daughter's individuality and volition. She had imposed this crowded inconvenience upon her willing spouse, and there was the grandiose Charles, for whom the best was never good enough, sitting down nonchalantly on the truckle bed. And it appeared to Mr. Prohack only a few weeks ago that the two children had been playing side by side in the same nursery, and giving never a sign that their desires and destinies would be so curious. Mr. Prohack felt absurdly helpless. True, he was the father, but he knew that he had nothing whatever to do, beyond trifling gifts of money and innumerable fairly witty sermons, divided about equally between the pair, with the evolution of those mysterious and fundamentally uncontrollable beings, his son and his daughter. The enigma of life pressed disturbingly upon him as he took the other bed, facing Charles, and he wondered whether Sissy, in her feminine passion for self-sacrifice, insisted on sleeping in the truckle contraption herself, or whether she permitted Ozzy to be uncomfortable. 5. I just came along, Charles opened simply, because Lady Emma was so positive that I ought to see you. She said that you very much wanted me to come. It isn't as if I wanted to bother you, or you could do any good. He spoke in an extremely low tone, almost in a whisper. Mr. Prohack comprehended that the youth was trying to achieve privacy and a domicile where all conversation and movements were necessarily more or less public to the whole flat. Charles' restraint, however, showed little or no depression, disappointment, or disgust, and no despair. "'But what's it all about, if I'm not being too curious?' Mr. Prohack inquired cautiously. "'It's all about my being up the spout, Dad. I've had a flutter, and it hasn't come off, and that's all there is to it. I needn't trouble you with the details, but you may believe me when I tell you that I shall bob up again. What's happened to me might have happened to anybody, and has happened to a pretty fair number of city swells. You mean bankruptcy? Well, yes, bankruptcy is the word. I'd much better go right through with it. The chit thinks so, and I agree. The chit? Mimi. Oh, so you call her that, do you? No, I never call her that. But that's how I think of her. I call her Miss Winstock. I'm glad you let me have her. She's been very useful, and she's going to stick by me. Not that there's any blooming sentimental nonsense about her. Oh, no. By the way, I know that Mater and Sis think she's a bit heron scarum, and you do too. Nevertheless, she was just as strong as Lady M that I should stroll up and confess myself. She said it was due to you. Lady M didn't put it quite like that. The truckle bed creaked as Charlie shifted uneasily. They caught a faint murmur of talk from the other room and Sissy's laugh. Lady Masculum happened to tell me once that you'd been selling something before you knew how much it would cost you to buy it. Of course, I don't pretend to understand finance myself. Ha, I'm only a civil servant on the shelf. But to my limited intelligence, such a process of putting the cart before the horse seems likely to lead to trouble, said Mr. Prohack, as is it were, ruminating. Oh, she told you that, did she? Charlie smiled. Well, the good lady was talking through her hat. That affair's all right. At least it would be if I could carry it through. But of course I can't now. It'll go in the general mess. If I was free, I wouldn't sell it at all. I'd keep it. There'd be no end of money in it, and I was selling it too cheap. It's a combine, or rather it would have been a combine, of two of the best paper mills in the country. And if I got it and could find time to manage it, my word, you'd see. No, what's done me in is a pure and simple stock exchange gamble, my dear father. Nothing but that. R. R. shares. R. R. What's that? Dad, where have you been living these years? Royal Rubber Corporation, of course. They dropped to eighteen shillings, and they ought to have done. I bought a whole big packet on the understanding that I should have a fortnight to fork out. They were bound to go up again. Haven't been so low for eleven years. How could I have foreseen that old Sample would go and commit suicide and make a panic? I never read the financial news except the quotations of my own little savings, and I've never heard of an old Sampler, said Mr. Prohack. 
"'Considering he was a front-page item for four days,' Charlie exclaimed, raising his voice and then dropping it again. And he related in a few biting phrases the recent history of the R.R. "'I wouldn't have minded so much,' he went on, "'if your particular friend, Mr. Softly Bishop, wasn't at the bottom of my purchase. "'His name only appears for some of the shares, "'but I've got a pretty good idea that it's he who's selling all of them to yours truly. "'He must have known something, and a rare fine thing he'd have made of the deal.' if I wasn't going bust, because I'm sure now he was selling to me what he hadn't got. Mr. Brohack's whole demeanour changed at the mention of Mr. Bishop's name. His ridiculous snobbish pride reared itself up within him. He simply could not bear the idea of softly Bishop having anything against a member of his family. Sooner would the inconsistent fellow have allowed innocent widows and orphans to be ruined through Charlie's plunging than that softly Bishop should fail to realise a monstrous profit through the same agency. "'I'll see you through, my lad,' said he briefly, in an ordinary casual tone. "'No, thanks. You won't,' Charlie replied. "'I wouldn't let you even if you could. But you can't. It's too big.' "'Ah! How big is it?' Mr. Brohack challengingly raised his chin. "'Well, if you want to know the truth, it's between a hundred and forty and a hundred and fifty thousand pounds.' I mean, that's what I should need to save the situation. You? cried the terror of the departments in amaze, accustomed though he was to dealing in millions. He had gravely miscalculated his sum. Ten thousand he could have understood, even twenty thousand. But a hundred and fifty! You must have been mad. Only because I've failed, said Charles. Yes, it'll be a great affair. I shall really make my name. Everybody will expect me to bob up again. I shan't disappoint them. Of course, some people will say I oughtn't to have been extravagant. Grand Babylon Hotel and so on. What rot! A flea bite! Why, my expenses haven't been seven hundred a month. Mr. Brohack sat aghast, but admiration was not absent from his sentiments. The lad was incredible in the scale of his operations. He was unreal, wagging his elegant legs so calmly that in the midst of all that fragile Japanese lacquer, and the family, grotesquely unconscious of the vastness of the issues, chatting domestically only a few feet away. But Mr. Brahack was not going to be outdone by his son, however Napoleonic his son might be. He would maintain his prestige as a father. "'I'll see you through,' he repeated, with studied quietness. "'But look here, Dad, you only came into a hundred thousand. I can't have you ruining yourself. And even if you did ruin yourself—' "'I have no intention of ruining myself,' said Mr. Brahack nor shall I change in the slightest degree my mode of life. You don't know everything, my child. You aren't the only person on earth who can make money. Where do you imagine you get your gifts from? Your mother? But be silent. Tomorrow morning, gilt-edged, immediately saleable securities will be placed at your disposal for a hundred and fifty thousand pounds. I never indulge in wildcat stock myself. And let me tell you there can be no question of your permitting or not permitting. I'm your father, and please don't forget it. It doesn't happen to suit me that my infant prodigy of a son should make a mess of his career, and I won't have it. If there's any doubt in your mind as to whether you or I are the strongest, rule yourself out of the competition this instant. It'll save you trouble in the end. Mr. Prohack had never felt so happy in his life, and yet he had had moments of intense happiness in the past. He could feel the skin of his face burning. You'll get it all back, Dad, said Johnny later. No amount of suicides can destroy the assets of the R.R. It's only that the market lost its head and absolutely broke to pieces under me. In three months, my poor boy— Mr. Prohack interrupted him. Do try not to be an ass. And he had the pleasing illusion that Charles was just home from school. And mind, not one word, not one word to anybody whatever. Six. The other three were still modestly chatting in the living room when the two great mysterious men of affairs returned to them. But Sissy had cleared the dining-room table, and transformed the place into a drawing-room for the remainder of the evening. They were very feminine. Even Ozzy had something of the feminine attitude of fatalistic, attending upon events beyond feminine control. He had it, indeed, far more than the vigorous-minded Sissy had it. They were cheerful, with a cheerfulness that made up intact what it lacked in sincerity. Mr. Brohack had compared them to passengers on a ship which is in danger. With a word, with an inflection, he reassured everybody, 
and yet said naught, and the cheerfulness instantly became genuine. Mr. Prohack was surprised at the intensity of his feelings. He was thoroughly thrilled by what he himself had done. Perhaps he had gone too far in telling Charlie that the putting down of a hundred and fifty thousand pounds could be accomplished without necessitating any change in his manner of living, but he did not care what change might be involved. He had the sense of having performed a huge creative act, and the reality of the power of riches. For weeks he had not been imaginatively cognizant of the fact that he was rich. He glanced secretly at the boy Charles, and said to himself, To that boy I am like a god. He was dead, and I have resurrected him. He may achieve an enormous reputation after all. Anyhow, he is an amazing devil of a fellow, and he's my son, and no one comprehends him as I do. Mr. Prohack became jolly to the point of uproariousness, without touching a glass. He was intoxicated, not by the fermentation of grapes, but by the magnitude and magnificence of his own gesture. He was the monarch of the company, and getting a bit conceited about it. The sole creature who withstood him in any degree was Sissy. She had firmness. She has married the right man, said Mr. Prohack to himself. The so-called feminine instinct is for the most part absurd, but occasionally it justifies its reputation. She has chosen her husband with unerring insight into her needs and his. He will be happy. She will have the anxieties of responsible power. But I am not her husband. And he spoke aloud, masterfully. Sissy? Yes, Dad, what now? I've uh, satisfactorily transacted affairs with my son. I will now try to do the same with my daughter. A few moments with you in the council chamber, please. Oswald also, if you like. Sissy smiled kindly at her awaiting spouse. Perhaps I'd better deal with my own father alone, darling. Ozzy accepted the decision. "'Look here, I think I must be off,' Charlie put in. "'I've got a lot of work to do.' "'I expect you have,' Mr. Prokak concurred. "'By the way, you might meet me at Smathe and Smathe's at uh, ten-fifteen in the morning.' Charlie nodded and slipped away. "'Infant,' said Mr. Prokak to the defiantly smiling bride who awaited him in the council chamber, "'has your mother said anything to you about our wedding present?' "'No, Dad. No, of course she hasn't. And do you know why? Because she daren't. With your infernal independence you've frightened the life out of the poor lady. That's what you've done. Your mother will doubtless have a talk with me tonight, and tomorrow she will tell you what she has decided to give you. Please let there be no nonsense. Whatever the gift is, I should be obliged if you will accept it, and use it without troubling us with any of your theories about the proper conduct of life. Wisdom and righteousness existed before you, and there's just a chance that they'll exist after you. Do you take me? Quite, father. Good. You may become a great girl yet. We are now going home. Thanks for a very pleasant evening. In the car, beautifully alone with Eve, who was in a restful mood, Mr. Brohack said, I shall be very ill in a few hours. Patty de foie gras is the devil, but caviar is Beelzebub himself. Eve merely gazed at him in gentle, hopeless reproach. He prophesied truly. He was very ill. And yet, through the succeeding crises, he kept smiling sardonically. "'When I think,' he murmured once with grimness, "'that that fellow bishop had the impudence to ask us to lunch, and Charlie too, Charlie too!' Eve, attendant, inquired sadly what he was talking about. "'Nothing, nothing,' said he. "'My mind is wandering. Let it.'" End of Part 2 of Chapter 22《ハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッ and because the noble mansion in Manchester Square was being redecorated, under compulsion of some clause in the antique lease, and Eve had invited him to leave the affair entirely to her. In the few months since Charlie's great crisis, all things conspired together to prove once more to Mr. Prohack that calamities expected never arrive. 
even the British Empire had continued to cohere, and revolution seemed to be further off than ever before. The greatest menace to his peace of mind, the League of All the Arts, had of course quietly ceased to exist. But it had established Eve as a hostess, and Eve as a hostess had gradually given up boring herself and her husband by large and stiff parties, and they had gone back to entertaining none but well-established and intimate friends with the maximum of informality as of old, to such an extent that occasionally in the vast and gorgeous dining-room of the noble mansion Eve would have had the roast planted on the table and would carve it herself, also as of old. Brule did not seem to mind. Mr. Brohacker bought the lease of the noble mansion, with all the contents thereof, nearly because this appeared to be the easiest thing to do. He had not been forced to change his manner of life, far from it. Owing to a happy vicissitude in the story of the R.R. Corporation, Charlie had called upon his father for only a very small portion of the offered one hundred and fifty thousand pounds, and had even repaid that within a few weeks. Matters had thereafter come to such a pass with Charlie that he had reached the pages of the Daily Picture, and was reputed to be arousing the jealousy of youthful millionaires in the United States. Also, the figure which he paid weekly for rent of his offices in the Grand Babylon Hotel was an item of common knowledge in the best clubs, and not to know it was to be behind the times in current information. No member of his family now ventured to offer advice to Charlie, who still, however, looked astonishingly like the old Charlie of motor-bicycle transactions. The fact is, people do not easily change. Mr. Prohack had seemed to change for a space, but if indeed any change had occurred in him, he had changed back. Scientific idleness? Turkish baths, dandyism, all vanished, contemned, forgotten. To think of them merely annoyed him. He did not care what necktie he wore. Even dancing had gone the same way. The dancing season was over until October, and he knew he would never begin again. He cared not to dance with the middle-aged, and if he danced with the young, he felt that he was making a fool of himself. It had been rather a lark to come and stay for a few days in his old home to pass the sacred door of the conjugal bedroom, closed for ever to him, and mount to Charlie's room, into which Sissy had put the bulk of the furniture from the Japanese flat, without overcrowding it. Decidedly amusing to sleep in Charlie's old little room. But the romantic sensation had given way to the sensation of the hardness of the bed. Breakfast achieved, Mr. Prohack wondered what he should do next, for he had nothing to do. He had no worries and almost no solicitudes. He had successfully adapted himself to his environment. Through the half-open door of the dining-room he heard Sissy and Ozzy. Ozzy was off to the day's business, and Sissy was seeing him out of the house, as Eve used to see Mr. Prohack out. Ozzy, by reason of a wedding present of ten thousand pounds, given in defiance of Sissy's theories, and with the help of his own savings, was an important fellow now in the theatrical world, having attained a partnership with the Napoleon of the stage. "'You'd no business to send for the doctor without telling me,' Sissy was saying in her harsh tone. "'What do I want with a doctor?' "'I thought it would be for the best, dear,' came Ozzy's lisping reply. "'Well, it won't, my boy.' The door banged. "'He never saw me off like that,' Mr. Prohack reflected. Sissy entered the room, some letters in her hand. She was exceedingly attractive, matron-like, interesting, but formidable," said Mr. Brohack, glancing up at her. "'It is the duty of the man to protect and the woman to charm, and I don't care who knows it.' "'What on earth do you mean, Dad?' "'I mean that it is the duty of the man to protect and the woman to charm.' Sissy flushed. "'Ozzy and I understand each other, but you don't,' said she, and made a delicious, rude face. "'Carthew's brought these letters, and he's waiting for orders about the car.' departed. Among the few letters was one from Softly Bishop, dated Rangoon. It was full of the world tour. "'We had a success at Calcutta that really does baffle description,' it said. "'We,' oui, commented Mr. Prohack. There was a postscript. "'By the way, I've only just learned that it was your son who was buying those royal rubber shares. I do hope he was not inconvenienced. I need not say that if I'd had the slightest idea he was standing the racket I should have waved—' and so on. "'Would you?' commented Mr. Prohack. "'I see you doing it. 
And what's more, I bet you only wrote the letter for the sake of the postscript. Your tour is not a striking success, and you'll be wanting to do business with me when you come back, but you won't do it. And here I am, lecturing Sissy about hardness. He rang the bell, and told a servant, who was a perfect stranger to him, to tell Carthew that he should not want the car. "'May Carthew speak to you, sir?' said the servant, returning. "'Carthew may,' said he, and the servant thought what an odd gentleman Mr. Prohack was. "'Well, Carthew,' said he, when the chauffeur, perturbed, entered the room, "'this is quite like old times, isn't it? Sit down and have a cigarette. What's wrong?' "'Well, sir,' replied Carthew, after he had lighted the cigarette and ejected a flake of tobacco into the hearth. "'There may be something wrong, or there mayn't, if you understand what I mean. But I'm thinking of getting married.' "'Oh! What about that wife of yours?' "'Oh, her? Oh, she's dead, all right. I never said anything feeling as it might be ashamed of her.' "'But I thought you'd done with women.' Uh, "'So did I, sir. But the question always is, have women done with you? I was helping her to lift pictures down yesterday, and she was standing on a chair, and something came over me. And there you are, before you know where you are, sir, if you understand what I mean.' "'Perfectly, Carthew. But who is it?' Uh, Machin, sir. Uh, to cut a long story short, sir, I've been thinking about her for the better part of some time. Because of the boy, sir. Uh, because of the boy. She likes him. If it hadn't been for the boy... Careful, Carthew. Well, well, perhaps you're right, sir, but she'd have copped me anyway. I congratulate you, Carthew. You've been copped by the best parlour-maid in London. Uh, thank you, sir. I think I'll be getting along, sir. Have you told Mrs. Prohack? I thought I'd best leave that to Machin, sir. Mr. Prohack waved a hand, thoughtful. He heard Carthew leave. He heard Dr. Vega arrive, and then he heard Dr. Vega leaving, and rushed to the dining-room door. Vega, A moment! Come in! Everything all right? Of course, absolutely normal. But you know what these young husbands are. I can't stop unless you're really ill, my friend. I'm worse than really ill, said Mr. Prohack, shutting the door. I'm really bored. I'm surrounded by the most interesting phenomena, and I'm really bored. I've taken to heart all your advice, and I'm really bored, so there. The agreeable, untidy, unprofessional Portuguese quack twinkled at him, and then said in his thick, sudden, highly un-English voice, The remedy may be worse than the disease. You are bored because you have no worries, my friend. I will give you advice. Go back to your treasury. I cannot, said Mr. Prohack. I've resigned. I found out that my friend Hunter was expecting promotion in my place. "'Ah, well,' replied Dr. Vega, with strange sardonic indifference, "'if you will sacrifice yourself to your friends, you must take the consequences like a man. "'I will talk to you some other time, when I have got nothing better to do. "'I am very busy telling people what they already know.' And he went. A minute later Charlie arrived in a car suitable to his grandeur. "'Look here, Dad,' said Charlie in a hurry. "'If you're game for a day out, I particularly want to show you something.' and incidentally you'll see some driving, believe me. My will is made. I am game, answered Mr. Prohack, delighted at the prospect of any diversion, however perilous. 2. When Charlie drew up at the Royal Pier, Southampton, having reached there in rather less time than the train journey and a taxi at each end would have required, he silently handed over the wheel to the chauffeur, and led his mystified but uninquiring father down the steps on the west side of the pier. A man in a blue suit with a peaked cap and a white cover on the cap was standing at the foot of the steps, just above the water, and above a motor launch containing two other men in blue jerseys with the name North Wind on their breasts and on their foreheads. A blue ensign was flying at the stem of the launch. "'How do you do, Snow?' Charlie greeted the first man, who raised his cap. Father and son got into the launch, and the man after them. The launch began to snort, and off it went at a racing speed from the pier towards mid-channel. Mr. Prohack, who said not a word, perceived a string of vessels of various sizes which he judged to be private yachts, though he had no experience whatever of yachts. Some of them flew bunting, and some of them didn't, but they all without exception appeared, as Mr. Prohack would have expected, to be the very simples of complicated elegance and luxury shining and glittering buoyantly there on the brilliant blue water under the summer sun. The launch was rushing headlong through its own white surge towards the largest of these majestic toys. 
As it approached the string, Mr. Prowax saw that all the yachts were much larger than he had imagined, and that the largest was enormous. The launch flicked itself round the stern of that yacht, upon which Mr. Prowax read the word North Wind in gold, and halted bobbing at a staircase whose rails were white ropes slung against a dark blue wall. The wall was the side of the yacht. Mr. Prowax climbed out of the bobbing launch, and the staircase had the solidity under his feet of masonry on earth. High up, glancing over the wall, was a capped face. "'How do you do, Skipper?' called Charlie. And when he got his parent onto the deck, he said, "'Skipper, this is my father. Dad, Captain Crowley.' Mr. Prowax shook hands with a short, stoutish, nervous man with an honest, grim, marine face. "'Everything all right?' Uh, "'Yes, sir. Glad you've come at last, sir. Good.' Charlie turned away from the captain to his father. Mr. Prowax saw a man hauling a three-cornered flag up the chief of the three masts which the ship possessed, and another man hauling a large oblong flag up a pole at the stern. "'What is the significance of this flag-raising?' asked Mr. Prowax. "'The significance is that the owner has come aboard,' Charlie replied, not wholly without self-consciousness. "'Come on, have a look at her. Come on, Skipper, do the honours. She used to be a Mediterranean trader. The former owner turned her into a yacht. He says she cost him a hundred thousand by the time she was finished. Ah, I can believe it.' Mr. Prowax also believed it easily. He believed it more and more easily, as he was trotted from deck to deck and from bedroom to bedroom and sitting-room to sitting-room, and library to smoking-room, and music-room to lounge, and especially from bathroom to bathroom. In no land habitation had Mr. Prohack seen so many, or such marmorial, or such luxurious bathrooms. What particularly astonished Mr. Prohack was the exceeding and minute finish of everything. And what astonished him even more than the finish was the cleanliness of everything. "'Dirty place to be in, sir, Southampton,' grinned the skipper. We do the best we can. They reached the dining-room, an apartment in glossy bird's-eye maple set in the midst of the virgin white promenade deck. Oh, by the way, lunch, please, said Charlie. Uh, yes, sir, responded eagerly the elder of two attendants in jackets striped blue and white. Have a wash, Governor. Thanks, Skipper, that'll do for the present. Mr. Prohack washed in amplitudinous marble and wiped his paternal face upon diaper into which was woven the name North Wind. He then, with his son, ate an enormous and intricate lunch, and drank champagne out of crystal engraved with the name North Wind, served to him by a ceremonious person in white gloves. Charlie was somewhat taciturn, but over the coffee he seemed to brighten up. "'Well, what do you think of the old hulk?' "'She must need an awful lot of men,' said Mr. Prohack. "'Pretty fair. The wages bill is seven hundred a month.' She's enormous, continued Mr. Prohack lamely. Oh, no, seven hundred tons, Thames measurement. You see those funnels over there? And Charlie pointed through the port windows to a row of four funnels rising over great sheds. That's the Mauritania. She's a hundred times as big as this thing. She could almost sling this affair in her davits. Indeed. Still, I maintain that this antique wreck is enormous, Mr. Prohack insisted. They walked out on deck. "'Hello, here's the chit. You can always count on her,' said Charles. The launch was again approaching the yacht, and a tiny figure with a dispatch case on her lap sat smiling in the stern sheets. "'She's come down by train,' Charles explained. Miss Winstock, in her feminineness, made a delicious spectacle on the spotless deck. She nearly laughed with delight as she acknowledged Mr. Prohack's grave salute and shook hands with him. But when Charlie said, "'Anything urgent?' She grew grave and tense, becoming the faithful, urgent, confidential employee in an instant. "'Only this,' she said, opening the dispatch case and producing a telegram. "'Confound it!' remarked Charles, having read the telegram. "'Here, you, Snow, please see that Miss Winstock has something to eat at once. That'll do, Miss Winstock.' "'Yes, Mr. Prohack, she said dutifully. "'And his mother thought he would be marrying her,' Mr. Prohack senior reflected. He'll no more marry her than he'll marry Machin. Goodness knows whom he will marry. It might be a princess. Do you remember that paper concern, newsprint stuff I've mentioned to you once or twice? said Charlie to his father, dropping into a basket chair. Sit down, will you, Dad? I've had no luck with it yet. He flourished the telegram. 
Here the new manager, I pointed, has gone and got rheumatic fever up in Aberdeen. No good for six months at least, if ever. It's a great thing if I can only really get it going, but no, the luck's wrong. And yet a sound fellow with brains could put that affair into such shape in a year that I could sell it at a profit of four hundred per cent to the Southern Combine. However, soon afterwards, he went below to talk to the chit, and the skipper took charge of Mr. Prohack, and displayed to him the engine-room, the officer's quarters, the forecastle, the galley, and all manner of arcana that Charlie had grandiosely neglected. "'It's a world,' said Mr. Prohack, but the skipper did not quite comprehend the remark. "'Well,' said Charlie, returning, "'we'll have some tea, and then we must be off again. I have to be in town to-night. Have you seen everything? What's the verdict? Some ship, eh?' Some ship, agreed Mr. Prohack, but the most shockingly uneconomic thing I've ever met with in all my life. How often do you use the yacht? Well, I haven't been able to use her yet. She's been lying here waiting for me for nearly a month. I hope to get a few days off soon. I understand there's a crew of thirty-odd, all able-bodied and knowing their job, I suppose, and all waiting for a month to give you and me a lunch and a tea. Seven hundred pounds in wages alone for lunch and a tea for two, without counting the food and the washing. "'Why not, Dad?' Charlie retorted calmly. "'I've got to spend a bit of money, uneconomically. Nothing like a yacht for doing it. No use for racing, and moreover it's too difficult not to mix with rascals if you go in for racing, and I, I don't care for rascals. Also, it's a mug's game, and I don't want to be a mug. As for young women, no. They only interest me at present as dancing partners, and they cost me nothing. A good yacht's the sole possible thing for my case.' and the yacht brings you into contact with clean and decent people, not bookmakers. I bought this boat for thirty-three thousand. She's a marvellous bargain, and that's something. But why spend money uneconomically at all? Because I said and swore I would. Didn't I come back from the war and try all I knew to obtain the inestimable privilege of earning my living by doing something useful? Did I succeed in obtaining the privilege? Why, nobody would look at me, and there were tens of thousands like me. Well, I said I'd take it out of this noble country of mine, and I am doing, and I shall keep on doing until I'm tired. These thirty men or so here might be at some useful productive work, fishing or merchant marining. They're otherwise engaged. They're spending a pleasant, wasteful month over our lunch and tea. That's what I enjoy. It makes me smile to myself when I wake up in the middle of the night. I'm showing my beloved country who won the peace. It's a scheme murmured Mr. Prohack, rendered thoughtful as much by the quiet and intense manner as by the matter of his son's oration. Boyish, of course, but not without charm. We were most of us boys, said Charlie. Mr. Prohack marshalled in his head the perfectly plain, simple reasoning necessary to crush Charlie to powder, and before crushing him to expose to him the crudity of his conceptions of organised social existence. But he said nothing having hit on another procedure for carrying out his parental duty to Charles. Shortly afterwards they departed from the yacht in the launch. Long ere they reached the waiting motor-car, the bunting had been hauled down. In the car, Mr. Bragg said, "'Tell me something more about that paper-making business. It sounds interesting.' 3. When Mr. Bragg reached his daughter's house again late in the night, it was his wife who opened the door to him. "'Good heavens, Arthur, where have you been? Poor Sissy is in such a state. I was obliged to come over and stay with her. She needs the greatest care.' Mm, "'We had a breakdown,' said Mr. Prague, rather guiltily. "'Who's we? Where? What breakdown? You went off without saying a word to anyone. I really can't imagine what you were thinking about. You're, you're just like a child sometimes.' "'I went down to Southampton with Charlie,' Carford explained, giving a brief and imperfect history of the day and adding that on the way home he had made a detour with Charles to look at a paper manufactory. "'And you couldn't have telephoned?' "'Never thought of it.' "'I'll run and tap at Sissy's door and tell her. Ossie's with her. You'd better go straight to bed. I'm hungry.' Eve made a deprecating and expostulatory noise with her tongue against her upper teeth. "'I'll bring you something to eat. At least I'll try to find something,' said she. "'And are you sleeping here too? Where?' Prohack demanded, when Eve crept into Charlie's old bedroom with a tray in her hand. "'I had to stay. I couldn't leave the girl. I'm sleeping in her old room.' "'The worst of these kids' rooms,' said 
Mr. Crag, with an affectation of calm, is that there are no easy chairs in them. Never struck me before. Look here, you sit on the bed and put the tray down there, and I'll occupy this so-called chair. Now, I don't want any sermons, and what is more, I can't eat unless you do. But I tell you, I'm very hungry. So would you be, if you'd have my day? You won't sleep if you eat much. I don't care if I don't. Is this whiskey? What, bread and cheese? A simple life, I'm not used to it. Where are you off to? There came a letter for you. I brought it along. It's in the other bedroom. Open it for me, my good child, said Mr. Prohack, his mouth full and his hands occupied, when she returned. She did so. It seems to me that you'd better read this yourself, she said naughtily. The letter was from Lady Massingham, signed only with her initials, announcing with a queer brevity that she had suddenly decided to go back at once to her native country to live. How strange, exclaimed Mr. Prohack, trying to be airy. Listen, what do you make of it? You're a woman, aren't you? I make of it, said Eve, that she's running away from you. She's afraid of herself, that's what she is. Didn't I always tell you? Oh, Arthur, how simple you are! But fancy at her age! Oh, my poor boy, shall you get over it? Eve bent forward and kissed the poor boy, who was cursing himself for not succeeding in not being self-conscious. Rot! he exploded at last. I said you were a woman, and by all the gods you are! Give me some more food. He was aware of a very peculiar and unprecedented thrill. He hated to credit Eve's absurd insinuation, but— And Eve looked at him superiorly, triumphant, sure of him, sure of her everlasting power over him. Yet she was not romantic, and her plump person did not in the least symbolise romance. "'I have a piece of news for you,' he said after a pause. "'After tonight I've done with women and idleness. I'm going into business.' I've bought half of that paper-making concern from your singular son, and I'm going to put it on its legs. I know nothing about paper-making, and I can only hope that the London office is not as dirty and untidy as the works. I've no idea what works were. The whole thing will be a dreadful worry, and I shall probably make a horrid mess of it. But Charlie seems to think I shan't. But why, what's come over you, Arthur? Surely we've got enough money. What has come over you? I never could make you out, and I never shall. Nothing, nothing, said he, only I've got a sort of idea that someone ought to be economic and productive. It may kill me, but I'll die producing anyhow. He waited for her to begin upbraiding him for capricious folly and expatiating upon the fragility of his health. But you never know where you are with an Eve. Eves have the most disconcerting gleams of insight. She said, I'm rather glad. I was getting anxious about you. End of chapter 23 End of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett